All right. Today is hump day. Um, but what's great about, about today, today is all about technique. And so things are going to start really coming together for you. All right. Uh, we've been talking about flavor. We've been talking about sauce and how important having a singular technique or a best practice and applying flavor structure to that is going to give you the ability to create your own unique dishes. And then the understanding of technique is the last piece in the puzzle. Then you fill in some minor gaps with execution and how to get a meal out in a timely fashion uh, consistently. And then uh, the final day we talk about preparation techniques, which we've been peppering throughout our conversations, uh, talking about blanching, talking about marinades, talking about brining, uh, all things that at this point you are now, uh, you've had a little bit of experience with. Okay, so this is how I like to think about my techniques. So you can turn to page 73 in your curriculum to follow along. So T is for technique. And I like sticking technique on this day because you already understand flavor structure. You already understand what it takes to make a sauce or a stock, which is important for some of the moist methods of, of cooking. But also, too, this helps put techniques into perspective as a tool for uh, creating the structure or creating the, the texture that you want, mainly in your proteins, because... What happens is if we start with technique and I say, oh, here's, here's a recipe for a pan-seared steak, here's a recipe for braised short ribs, you get lost in the fact that it's a recipe and, you don't, and you're not able to separate, uh, separate out the fact that the technique that we're applying to that short rib is braising or the technique that we're applying to the steak is searing and everything else is just secondary flavor structures and personal preference, okay? So you have four quadrants of technique. You have slow and moist, Dry and slow, fast and dry, fast and moist. Everything that you cook will fit into one of these categories, every technique that you apply. And all of these techniques have different applications depending upon the protein that you're cooking. Again, we're going to be focusing specifically on proteins today because that's the hardest thing to master. Vegetables is just usually you, uh, you blanch your starchy vegetables starting in cold water. You bring them up until they're tender. Boom, you're done. You cool them off. You blanch your green vegetables like we talked about yesterday in boiling salted water until you got that tenderness that you're looking for. You shock them in ice water. Boom, you're done. There's not a whole lot of deviation in those areas. Okay, So... We're going to list the techniques, and then we're going to talk about why you would choose a certain technique over you know, another technique and why, uh, you know, what's, what's the best technique for a given application. So in the slow and moist category, you have braising, stewing, and hopefully everyone's new found favorite technique, sous vide. I know you guys had a lot of questions about sous vide. We've answered some of them throughout the last couple of days, but today is the time to really talk about sous vide, okay? Then in the dry and slow category, you have roasting, smoking, or barbecue. Barbecue is basically slow smoke to food. And then confit, or oil poaching. In the fast, and dry category, you have boiling, I'm sorry, fast and moist category, boiling, simmering, which is just a very slow percolating boil, a couple of, of uh, bubbles breaking the surface every now and then, steaming and poaching. And finally, in the fast and dry category, you have roasting slash baking, grilling, also referred to as barbecue in the United States, but different than the barbecue of smoking or slow smoke, searing, sauteing and stir frying basically the same technique just the application is different one uses a wok one uses a saute pan and broiling so why does this matter why do we separate these techniques like this well it's because we if we understand how these techniques fall within the technical charts of cooking then we can make the appropriate decision i have people who send me emails saying hey i watched your video on braising so i decided that i was going to braise a chicken breast but it came out really, really dry. Why is that? Well, it's because no one ever told you that while, because they see my video on my, my braised chicken thighs, but no one told them, hey, 
chicken breast doesn't have collagen in it, okay? So you need a fast cooking method, whether moist or dry, for meat that has little collagen, okay? At this point too, you see me break down a tenderloin, right? We've looked at silver skin on the pork tenderloins. We've looked at silver skin on the connective tissue that runs on the beef tenderloins. We've broken down a salmon together and we see how the salmon is, is pure fish flesh. It doesn't have a whole lot of connective tissue. It's just one solid muscle. So you're starting to identify the fact that all meat is not created equal. They're structurally different. Okay, we touched briefly yesterday when we were talking about our sauces and our stocks of collagen. And that was an important precursor to what we'll be discussing today. So again, your collagen is this triple helix of gelatin. And it's there to provide structure. So when you braise a short rib, so you take a short rib, right? And you, you can look at it and you can see the connective tissue. But if you're not sure where the short rib comes from on the animal, if the name doesn't, isn't a dead giveaway, then you can look at a beef chart. You know, just Google it. You look at a beef chart. Basically, anything that comes from the upper and inside of the cow, so the, so the back of the cow or the back of any four-legged land animal, anything that comes from the back region inside the rib cage is a lazy muscle. It's insulated by the ribs, it's insulated by the shoulders and the legs, so it doesn't do much work. That's where your New York strip comes from, where you cut steaks. That's where your beef tenderloin comes from, where you cut steaks. All right, and there's other secondary muscle groups that are kind of tucked back behind shoulders. All right, so the, uh, the flank steak is cut from the upper interior portion of the shoulder. So it gets a little bit of work, you can cook it medium and it won't be chewy, but it, I mean, you still have, it's not going to be as tender as a filet mignon, which gets almost no work. It's not going to be as tender as a New York strip. So understanding where these muscles originate from is going to dictate the cooking technique that you use. And it really is as simple as lazy muscles, you cook fast. Workhorse muscles, you cook slow. Bottom line, because of collagen, you have to break this collagen down into gelatin. So what happens is you have that tough short rib. My dad used to cook ribs all the time on the grill, right? And I hated ribs. Remember what we talked about yesterday? You know, the reason why you hate something is because you probably haven't had it cooked right yet. So he'd take these big old fat beef ribs and he would char the hell out of them on the grill for about, you know, 15, 20 minutes until they were completely well done. And I'd bite into them and they'd be chewy and you'd sauce them with a bunch of barbecue sauce made from like ketchup and Worcestershire sauce. And, and that, was, that was ribs in my family growing up. What my dad didn't know is that ribs contain a lot of collagen and they need to be cooked low and slow. So grilling is a fast and dry cooking method. You throw them on the grill, by the time the exterior is charred and you have that golden brown, you look at the ribs, you're like, oh, look at these beautiful ribs. You bite into them and they're chewy. Okay, so you need slow heat to break down this collagen into gelatin. So people talk about falling off the bone tender, right? They say, hey, I have this short rib. Oh, it's so tender, it's falling off the bone tender, it shreds. Well, really, it's not tender, it's not a tender piece of meat. What gives it the perception of tender is all that tough, chewy connective tissue that used to hold that muscle together and bind it together is now dissolved in a gelatin, and you have all these little shredded pockets within, and you can now chew it. Now, what makes uh, something like that interesting is the fact that to break down this gelatin, normally speaking, unless you're applying various different techniques that we'll talk about in a second, you're looking at about a minimum of 155 degrees Fahrenheit to 165 degrees Fahrenheit. But really, in this, in this 150 to 155 range is kind of the sweet spot if you're being careful about applying slow heat, okay? Uh, but this is about five to 10 degrees above the point where muscle fibers will fully contract and press out all their moisture. So how then is a short rib juicy? Well, it's not. What it is, 
is you take a shorib, you braise it, you give it the appearance of tenderness or the perception of tenderness by having it shreddable, and you have individual muscle fibers that are not so co closely condensed, and then you take a great reduction sauce and you mop it into the meat, and then you serve it, and the moisture from that good sauce and the flavor from that good sauce gives you the perception of a tender, moist piece of meat that would otherwise be dry and chewy. That's why techniques like applying very slow and thorough heat while cooking, while cooking these tough cuts of meat are very important. That's also why sous vide is universally loved by chefs because we don't necessarily have to adhere to this rule anymore. Okay, so we'll talk about that in a second. So let's talk first about braising. We went over yesterday extensively, we went over pan roasting, right? So I told you if, you, if you leave this boot camp understanding, not perfecting, but understanding how to pan roast and create a pan sauce and how to braise and then create a sauce from that, and you understand it enough to go home and practice it with various cuts of meat, then you will be ages ahead of anyone else that you know who loves to cook on a hobby level, okay? And you'll be a way ahead of a good percentage of professional cooks out there because I find new cooks that come to my kitchen who've had experience don't always understand the finer points of pan roasting and braising. And the reason why some, those two techniques are so important, why I stress those, is because, well, you have a tender cut of meat, you can always pan roast it and make a sauce, right? You have a tough cut of meat, you can always braise it. Now, those aren't your only options, but those will be your go-tos. When you want to knock one out of the park without thinking about it, those are the ones that you use. When family and friends come over and you want to serve them a filet mignon, boom, you get out your big 12-inch ca cast iron pan, your 12-inch saute pan, you can probably fit about six to eight fillets in there. If you can't, then you just par sear them all in turn and then you put them on a sheet tray. You finish them in the oven, just like you finished all your fillets last night. You have your fawn, your resulting sauce, you make your sauce, you're good to go. All right, so with the, both the pan sauce technique and the braising technique, it requires a liquid. You could use water, but it's not going to turn out that great, especially with this pan sauce. It's not going to turn out at all. You can really braise in water, though, and you're making a a sort of a stock as you go, but your flavors are going to be a little weak. So for home use, what I do is I just have an all-purpose stock. Anytime I eat anything with a bone, if it's enough to make a gallon of stock, I just throw it in a pot. I don't overthink it. I throw in some carrots and some celery, anything I have. If I don't have aromatics, if I, if I don't have them because I don't always fully stock my kitchen at my restaurant, I still have a pot. I still have water, right? So I'm extracting the collagen. Okay, so I eat a roasted chicken, and I roast chicken a lot at home because it's really easy to, to make. And so I take the leftover roasted chicken. I usually sacrifice the breast to my stock because I don't really like the breast that much. So we throw them in the pot, cover with cold water, bring up to a simmer, I'll cover it with a lid and put it on my lowest burner setting, and I'll leave it over overnight. Next day I strain it. If I have time, if, if, my, you know, if I'm gonna work early and my wife's gonna be around for a couple hours, I'll just turn it up to like medium high, let it reduce and tell her, hey, you know, when this pot's half full, just turn it off and put it in a container, pop it in the fridge and we'll freeze it later. So then what happens is, is you have this constant flow of stock. So the next time I make stock, I take my not so good stock that just had a chicken carcass in it, right? Take any bones that I have, maybe I was eating pork chops that night, throw the pork chops in there. Maybe this time around I have carrots, maybe this time around I have onions. Maybe I throw some garlic in there. Right? Take the stock from the freezer, pop it in the microwave for a couple of seconds, just thaw it from the container, put it in, make another stock, reduce that again. And you just have this kind of ongoing stock that after a couple of times, you're just sitting in your freezer, and I just keep it in like the little Tupperware containers. And then you have a good base to create sauces from and to braise with. And braising itself will also reinforce your stock with more collagen because you're braising something to break down the collagen that's in it and that collagen is going to turn into gelatin and it's going to 
dissolve into your sauce, and then you can, you, you can take out some of your stock that you're making in that braising process, reduce that down to serve with your braised meat that evening, and you take the rest and you freeze it, right? So you have this like ongoing thing, and once you, once you get in the habit of it, it's not that hard. You're putting water in a pot and you're simmering it for, you know, overnight. Don't even think about the classic, like, oh, well, you gotta simmer chicken stock for six hours, and you gotta simmer veal stock for 12 hours. Whatever, yeah, in a professional kitchen, that's what we do because it's a little bit different. We've got to be a little more refined and fine-tuned. But I'll tell you what, I make some great sauces at home with this stock, and it's just popping stuff in water. You bring it to a simmer, and you rip it down. If you're eating bones of pork chop or, you know, uh, you have like a, a ribeye that's bone in, save them. Throw them in a gallon Ziploc bags. Throw them in the freezer. When you fill up a freezer bag, you know, two freezer bags, you make some stock, okay? Then if you want to get real creative, they, got, they have a sale going on. Like at Costco, sometimes you can get like two chickens for 10 bucks, right? So I'll either roast two chickens and you'll just have a bunch of like, you know, chicken salad sandwiches and all that sort of stuff. We eat chicken for a couple of days and use the carcasses. Or you make a really flavorful stock by roasting one chicken. You sacrifice the entire chicken to the other one because really it's only costing you five bucks. So you throw the chicken in the pot, right? You boil the hell out of it to, to extract all of its flavor and all of its gelatin. And then you take the carcass from the other chicken that you ate, you throw it in there and you reinforce your stock. And that right there will give you a really good head start on making a stock. How long so you're talking about bones of stuff you've already cooked? Yep, bones of stuff I've already cooked. Except for that chicken. Yeah, and every now and then, because meat adds a lot of flavor to your stock, so, uh, I mean, that's, like, so you have, like, the, like the, in the Chinese restaurants, a lot of their chicken stocks are actually made with whole chicken meat uh, and the bones, and that's what, what gives it a really nice aroma and flavor. And, you know, people get a lot, you know, really caught up in waste sometimes. And for me, I don't see that as a waste. Buying a chicken on sale for five, six bucks and turning it into a really flavorful, rich stock that I can then freeze and have down the line, like, that's worth it to me. You know, and it makes things a lot easier because, you know, sometimes I just want to go home and, and, you know, sear a steak or eat a bowl of cereal. Who knows? But every now and then you get this, this hankering to, you know, you see like a nice ribeye is on sale. And so you grab a ribeye and you grab some mushrooms. You're like, hey, I got some nice gelatin-rich stock at home. Then all of a sudden you go home, you see, your, you see your ribeye, right? Throw in some onions, throw in some mushrooms. Boom, boom, boom. Oh, I got some red wine. Psh, you're, that's your deglaze. Grab your stock from the freezer, pop it in the microwave, pour it into the pan once it's melted. You reduce it down. And all of a sudden you have this amazing ribeye with a mushroom sauce. And people are like, how the hell did you do that? Well, in your slow cooker, you could do it in slow cooker too. In a slow cooker? Uh, make a stock or? Couldn't you? Yeah, you can make a stock in a slow cooker. You're not gonna, it's not gonna yield that much though. Well, yeah, I mean, it's not as big as a... So you can, but I mean, I, I like to err on the side of using a lot of water, because really what I'm doing is I'm, you're going to be extracting some flavor, but really what I'm doing at home is I'm extracting gelatin. Because that's the hardest thing to get in a, home, in a home stock, right? So I boil the hell out of it. I just have like a 12 quart stock pot. So I, so I really use a lot of water to make sure I'm fully extracting that gelatin because you can always cheat at home. You can add some other flavors. You know, you can add some store-bought chicken stock. You can add a little splash of that. But the store-bought chicken stock doesn't have the gelatin, so it's not going to work that well for reduction. Um, by the time you add your red wine, by the time you add your other aromatics like your shallots or your onions or your mushrooms for your sauce, you're going to have a pretty flavorful liquid, especially once you reduce it. What you're not going to commonly have on hand is a gelatin-rich stock. Have you seen those little, um, the little by Nor brand? They're they're called home style. Uh -huh. The little the little things. I was we just for some reason have one in our refrigerator up here. It's already expired, but um, I was looking at the ingredient list. It has xanthan gum in it. Mm -hmm. It has some other. It had lots of ingredients. It wasn't just um, you know meat bones and water. <laughs> right. <laughs> but it did have xanthan gum. You know, so I you know trying to I don't know if it's trying to get that. It's just like a little gelatin. Thing. Yeah, and those and those work. I've never tasted them though. I have no idea. Those do work in a pinch. Um, in in professional kitchens, we have something called demi glace gold, which we don't use, but a lot of a lot of restaurants. Yeah, it's just like a, a chunk of of demi glace. But they you have but the thing is to make it shelf stable, so you can ship it. You have to use stabilizers and preservatives, which I'm not necessarily against. It's just never going to taste as good. And what I'm saying is you're eating stuff with bones all the time. Just don't waste it. You know, it's like just do it a couple of times 
and then you're going to be like, oh, this really is easy. It's a simple, like, please don't overthink it. We have a very, very detailed section on how to make a proper classic stock because you should understand how to make one. But the most important thing is, is don't waste that gelatin in the bones because that's the key to giving a great body to your sauce. And even then, if you reduce the sauce, you're like, okay, look, the sauce is, is you know, getting pretty low and I ta I'm tasting it, the flavor is good, but it's just not looking like it's going to thicken. I might not have enough gelatin there. That's where your starch thickeners come in. And we have a whole section on that. We talked about starch thickeners yesterday. You know, and so you can add a thickener. You can add a quick little cornstarch slurry. It's not a, it's not a big deal. You know, so that's going to give you a big, a big jump forward. But with braising specifically, it's, you don't want to use store-bought stocks, generally speaking, because, because they have too much sodium in them. And the whole idea is you want to be able to reduce your stock afterwards and have a good body stock. You have a good reduction sauce. That's, that's what really makes a braised meat special, okay? Because the, the meat's dry. It's overcooked. So you have to re-moisten it with a glazed sauce. How long will these stacks last in your freezer? Pretty much indefinitely. Really? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's liquid, so you have a block of ice. And, and so, and, and to kind of, to keep them a little on the fresher side, every time I make a stock, I just, I pop my old stock in there from the freezer. And so, that, so that's a reinforcement step. So after you do this four or five times, all of a sudden you're like, hey, I got a Stella style reinforced stock in my freezer. Then you can say, okay, well, it doesn't really look like I'm gonna be using a whole lot of this because you get, I mean, four quarts very quickly of reinforced stock especially if you eat as much roasted chicken as I do, right? So you get to that quickly and you're like, hey, look, it looks like I'm not really going to be using a whole lot of this in the, in the near future, you know, maybe just small little portions of it. That's when you melt it down, you pour it into some ice cube trays, freeze it, and then you pop, pop out the ice cubes, pop them in a Ziploc bag, and you keep that in the freezer. And then when you're making a pan reduction sauce, you know, you go through, you hit, hit it with your red wine, you do all that stuff, you take like three or four ice cubes, throw them in the pan, let them melt, come to a simmer, reduce until you have that nappe consistency, and you go through your finishing stage. And that's a real easy way to do pan sauce for one or two people. So you keep maintaining like a beef stock at home and a chicken? Nope. Stock? I combine them all. Yeah. Okay. So a big old all-purpose stock. Here, we maintain a bunch of different stocks because we want to, you know, because you're paying good money to eat here. Right. So we want to make sure that we're, we're being true to the duck breast. We're being true to, you know, the filet mignon. You know, that's what you expect when you spend $35 for an entree. But at home, a, a gelatin-rich reduced meat sauce tastes great no matter what you pour it on, all right? Because no one does reduction sauces at home. When's the last time you were over at a friend's house and you had a, a reduction sauce? Never. <laughs> and it's easy. It's easy. The only hard part is having that, that stock, okay? And people are going to be high-fiving you out the door. The, what makes... What makes restaurant food, especially proteins, what makes it, people come through that door time and time again are the sauces. And the thing that people always rave about, I mean, yeah, we can make a good complex emulsion, but that's not really that hard to do once you understand the basics of emulsion and flavor structure. What most people can't replicate at home is that demi-gloss on their steak. They can throw that steak on the grill and hit mid-rare, just takes a couple of practice tries, you know, but they can't replicate that demi-gloss. So if you cook your steak to mid-rare, or you cook your chicken breast perfectly after you brine it through pan roasting, or you braise your chicken thighs, and you serve it with a reduction sauce, then boom. People are like, well, how the hell did you make this? Right? And a great, a great thing is, is all of you guys leaving this class should be eating chicken all the time. Because it's, because it's, a, perfect, it's a perfect animal to practice with. We have plenty, we have a couple different chicken fabrication videos online. You know, we did a demonstration, but you can go back and refresh your memory. So you go to Costco, you buy a two pack of chicken, okay? You break it down into breasts, leg and thighs. Your breasts are good for what cooking technique? Pan roasting. Pan roasting. The thighs that get a lot of work are good for what cooking technique? Braising. braising. That's right, so a couple of nights you practice pan roasting. A couple of nights you practice braising, right? And you have, you're generating tons of carcasses to create your to create your stocks, right? And chicken's inexpensive, so you get your pan roasting technique down on a cheap chicken breast, 
And then when it comes time to drop some money on a fat filet mignon for a special occasion, you're much more comfortable with it. When it comes time to, to braise, slow braise a short rib, you're much more com confident with the technique. The only difference is between chicken and short ribs is you leave it in the oven for another you know, two to three hours. Okay? So let's look at a traditional braising setup only because we need to put into perspective what we're actually doing here. So this is, this is not just to kind of give you the punchline ahead. This is actually not how modern kitchens braise, but we need to put the modern technique of braising into perspective. But this is a very valid technique, and this is where the word braise comes from. So you have your, they have what's called a brazier, a brassier, okay? And it was cast iron, very, very similar to a cast iron Dutch oven that you see today, okay? The only difference was, is the lid was flat and really, really heavy. And sometimes it would have like a, a rim that fit into the, into the pot very, very snugly, okay? And because this was the time, before the time of fancy stoves, they would cook over coal. So they would, they would make their fire and they'd let everything burn down. And then they'd throw the, this pot right on top of the coals and it's cast iron so it maintains heat really, really well. And they would charge it with heat, and they'd throw a little bit of cooking oil down in there. And they'd sear their steak, or sorry, not steak, because you wouldn't want to braise a steak. They'd sear like a shoulder, they'd sear uh, a roast, anything that has a high collagen content, a tough piece of meat. They'd throw it in there, sear. Why? Why do you sear? Flavor. Not to lock in juices, you sear for flavor, because the Maillard reaction creates complex flavor aromas that taste delicious, taste better than stewed meat that's not browned ever. So you brown for flavor, and also that brown flavor is going to dissolve into your sauce. And what else are you generating on the bottom of that pan? Fawn, that's right. See, I told you this is easy. So you generate that fawn. Do you have okay. flour? Do you have flour it? You can. So that technique is called farinier, which in your... Uh, it's, it's in the, the thickener section, but basically you add a little bit of flour because just like a roux, the, when the flour browns, it adds a nuttiness to it. Classically speaking, with this technique, you wouldn't flour it because you're not adding a whole lot of liquid. Okay, but you, but you can. And then once you add your liquid into your braising or your stewing, it, uh, the flour will act as a slight thickening agent. So they would use that residual fat in the bottom of the pan to brown their vegetables. So they take, you know, French technique, so they're using their mirepoix, which is carrot, celery, carrot, celery onions. Yep, mirepoix, and then they probably use some aromatic uh, herbs, like some thyme or some bay leaf. So they brown their vegetables, because again, brown vegetables, especially in this application, are gonna taste better than just regular simmered vegetables. And then they would add Liquid, whether it's water, wine, uh, stock, or a combination thereof. Usually, in this technique, this is a peasant dish. So they'd add maybe a little bit of, of wine that was passed, you know, was open too long, uh, which usually doesn't happen a whole lot in French households, so for the most part, it'd be water. Okay? So, it's always funny. People are like, like what do you do with, with wine when you don't drink it all? I'm like, what? <laughs> Never had that problem. <laughs> so they put the liquid in, and what you'll notice is they put just enough liquid to cover the vegetables in the bottom of the pot, but not to cover the meat. Okay? And then they take this lid, they throw it on top, they seal it tightly, and then they take a little coal shovel and they pile coals on top of the lid as well. And what happens? is you create a convection cycle of heating where this, where the liquid starts to evaporate, it hits the top of the lid, turns into steam, braise, uh, basting the meat as it falls back down, creating a moist heat environment and slowly roasts this piece of meat. This is actually a really cool technique to do when you go camping. It's really, really fun and pretty, pretty easy because once you have the coals on top, you walk away, you drink some beer for like three hours, and you come back and you open up this, this pot, and people are like, oh my goodness, that's amazing. 
Now what happens is because you have just a little bit of liquid, it becomes very flavorful because any of the liquid that comes out of this meat isn't diluted. Okay? So this is traditional braising done in a brassiere. What we know it as in modern times, what my grandmother called it, is pot roasting. Now the only difference is that tight fitting lid. So normal Dutch ovens that you have, they can work a little bit, uh, but you still have a little bit of moisture evaporation from the edge of the lid. What, what some people do if they're really hardcore about this technique and they can't find a brassiere is they go and they get uh, some modeling clay and they put modeling clay around the rim of their Dutch oven to seal it in and it turns, you know, you're basically baking it into a ceramic and then when you're done, you hit it with a hammer and it shatters and you pull the lid off. Yes? It's like a French cookbook where they take a simple bread dough and create a seal with the bread mm -hmm. dough to roast it. You could do that as well, but the thing is, is, is bread dough isn't, bread isn't completely impermeable. But that's just for hardcore crazies. All pot, all pot roast at home with just a cast iron Dutch oven and a lid, and I'll call it good, you know. Um, so this is, this is the traditional method of braising. So what we think of braising today is actually stewing, right? So, yes, sir? Could you put aluminum foil and then put the lid on there? And... You could, but then you wouldn't be so cool because you're using a modern-day thing. Like a, I mean, yeah, I mean, the, the, like, like I said, this is, so having, so keeping this environment completely moist and filled with steam is important because what are we doing? We're creating a moist heat environment and we're cooking this low and slow. So if, if we didn't have any moisture in here or if our moisture evaporated out during the cooking process, then we would be cooking this high and fast, right? Because we're cooking this over hot coals, you're still putting this in a hot oven. Right, so what's happening is you're basically, you're, you're regulating the temperature of steam because steam can only get so hot. It can only get to 212 degrees Fahrenheit at sea level. What, what do you say, right? For this, I'd set it at 400. Oh, that's hot. Yeah, because you want it, because basically what you're doing, because you also have the sides of the pot have radiant heat that are radiating in towards the meat that are keeping it brown or helping it to continue browning very, very slowly but then you have the steam coming down and basting and that's what's keeping your meat moist, okay? But normally, what I will do instead is I will do a stew method, which today we call braising. So you have, you have your pot, okay? Or you have a braising pan. Take my short rib, I'm gonna sear it. Again, to generate some flavor. If I, have it, if, I, if I was proper about searing my short rib and didn't have my pan too crazy hot, then I'm gonna have some fat left over my pan that I can then, and a little bit of fond, that I can then use to brown my aromatics in that same pan. If I was being a little careless and my pan got a little bit too hot after my short ribs were browned, I would just toss that pan or clean it and then start in a fresh pan. That way I'm not giving an acrid flavor or a burnt flavor to my vegetables, okay? But ideally you brown your aromatics in the same pan because that way you can then deglaze with red wine because you're using a browned meat. You scrape, scrape, scrape all those nummies off the bottom of the pan to incorporate them into your sauce. And then your short ribs Go into the pot with your aromatics underneath. So again, this is your mirepoix. And that's just helpful because I mean, they, they tell you to do it because of, of scorching. It could possibly scorch. If you're cooking, your, if you're doing your braise, your stew at the proper temperature, you're probably not gonna have an issue, so it's not gonna be a big deal. But you do it like this because it's tradition. And you can't piss off the French that much. I mean, we already changed the names of, their, of the mother sauces, so you know. <laughs> so we'll throw the aromatics on the bottom, throw the short ribs on the top. And then some chefs are adamant that you only cover the meat 
by two thirds. I never understood why. I think that's kind of lame because it makes it way less forgiving than if you just cover the meat all the way. All right, because if something happens in that cooking process, then you're going to have a dry piece of meat hanging out on top that's going to be getting, you know, a lot of dry air. It's going to dry out on you. Then, you place a lid on top, slightly askew, to allow for evaporation. And your wine is going to be warm from the deglazing process. But the stock that you add should be at least room temperature, okay? And that'll cool off your wine sufficiently. And the reason is, is you want to take this whole mixture, pop it into your oven, and then turn your oven on, okay? And then you turn your oven on to 200 degrees Fahrenheit for the first about two hours. Now, why is that important? Well, what makes it important, so let me write this step. So, so deglaze, add cold stock, cover, place in cold oven, and then 200 degrees Fahrenheit for at least the first, uh, for at least the, the second hour. So the first two hours. So we talked about yesterday very briefly when we were, when I was answering a question about sous vide, how meats contain enzymes. So when you slaughter a, a, a cow or a pig for meat, just like any animal or any mammal or any creature really, they have, they go into rigor mortis. Okay. So you can't eat them right away because it's, you know, it's, it's not going to happen. So they go into rigor mortis and then enzymes go to work and start to naturally just kind of break down the tissue. And that's what makes, uh, makes it uh, edible, right? It starts to break down a little bit of the connective tissue, starts to break down some of the proteins, and that's what makes it edible. Now, most all the steaks that you get, and that's otherwise noted because dry aged steaks are very expensive to do, are going to be wet aged. So they basically put them in a vacuum sealed bag and they sit in their own juices, uh, usually on the shelf. I mean, they, they pretty much take the tenderloins, they'll throw them in the bag, you know, ship them out, and then they'll sit at your, at your supplier's shelf for a week. You know, then they'll go to, you know, the, the restaurant supplier and they'll sit there maybe for a week. And they get to us and they're a couple weeks old at that point. So they've been wet aged. And it's had enough time and a, a little bit of enzymatic reaction to, to tenderize them enough to where they're, they're edible and you're like, okay, this is a tender steak. It's not a tough, you know, gamey uh, piece, piece of beef. So these enzymes that do that during dry aging form all sorts of great flavors and aromas, especially when you take it past 31 days. But also just dry aging at, you know, the seven day mark is going to make a cut of beef much more tender than no dry aging at all. Now, why is that important? We're talking about braising. Like, who cares, right? Well, number one, the short ribs that we do, we'll dry age them for seven days just because we can. We have big enough space for it. That's not really realistic in a home kitchen. Uh, but if you, wanna, if you have a big fridge and you've got space to lay them out, just lay them on a cheesecloth and you dry age them. But that's not the point. The point is this, is between 120 to 130 degrees Fahrenheit, those same enzymes that make your meat tender and flavorful during dry aging are hyperactivated. So the longer you can hold your meat in this window, the more tender your meat will be, the more the, easily the collagen will break down. And if the collagen breaks down easier, then you can break it down at a lower temperature, okay? And also too, we were talking about gradient heat, right? Cooking with a heat gradient. What happens is this will cook your short ribs more evenly all the way through. And because of that, you have this even heat that penetrates very, very, very slowly. And the gelatin 
or the collagen will dissolve into gelatin. And when it dissolves, it doesn't immediately all exit the meat. It only exits the meat when too much heat is applied. And then now all the gelatin ends up in your sauce. Now, what do we know about gelatin? Well, everyone here has had jello, right? Good, because if you haven't, you'd be a bunch of weirdos. <laughs> gelatin binds with water. That's what it does. So the interior moisture in the meat, before the gelatin actually evacuates the meat, the gelatin will bind with the interior moisture, keeping your braised meat moist. So what you do is after this two, after this two hour mark, you can raise your oven to by 50 degrees if you're in a bit of a hurry. If you're not, then you're gonna add a couple more hours to your braise time and you're gonna leave it at 200. Okay, but if you raise it to 250, then at about the hour mark, they're not gonna be done. So, at the, so an, another an additional hour at 250 for a three hour total cook time, they're not going to be done, but they're gonna be flirting with done, especially if you're at sea level, okay? So you wanna start checking them at the three hour mark and see if they're tender. Once they're tender, you have about a 15 to 30 minute window to pull them before that gelatin totally evacuates out versus if you're braising in a 400 degree oven, your window would be about five minutes, okay? So you wanna take, once they're tender, and up here, it takes about, when you raise the 250, it's gonna take you about four hours and 15 minutes total cook time. When you keep it at 200 the entire time, it's gonna take you five to six hours, right? But the great thing is, is you don't really have to babysit this. And once you do it a couple of times and you know your kitchen and you know your oven and, and your environment, it's gonna be the same pretty much every time. So you wake up Sunday morning, you sear some meat, you sear some mirepoix, maybe you're even thinking ahead and you cut up all your mirepoix and stuff the night before. So all you do is a quick sear, it's gonna take you about 20 minutes together to put everything in the oven. And then you go about your day for six hours. And you come back and you check them and like, oh yeah, they're done, that's perfect. Now, when you pull the short ribs from the oven, you wanna let them cool in their own juices. Cool in juices until their internal temperature is about 135 130 Fahrenheit. And this is for the same reason that we rest meats. A lot of times people say that, hey, so you have a, you have a steak, right? And you cook that steak. And what happens is all the juices, because you're using a heat gradient, are getting pushed into the center of that meat. That's why if you take a hot steak straight from the oven and you cut it in half, you see juice spill everywhere. But that's actually incorrect. What's really going on is the fact that above 135 degrees Fahrenheit, even though the muscles haven't contracted enough to push all the moisture out, muscle fibers themselves can't actually retain moisture. So the moisture just kind of pools inside the meat. So when you drop your meat past or back down, one below 135, more preferably 130, now the muscle fibers are again able to absorb all the meat, or excuse me, all the juices. So when you slice that meat in half, once it drops below 130, you look at it and you see a beautiful glistening wall of juices. Okay, so what's gonna happen then is even though your short ribs aren't a steak and they will be slightly overcooked, even if you're very careful in this method, they will still have muscle fibers that aren't fully constricted that can still retain moisture. So you cool the short ribs in their juices to 130, and then at that point, you can start your finishing stage, which is what? Sauce. Sauce. So have you used a meat thermometer to know it's cool down to that, or? Yeah. And I'll, I'll, just, I'll just take the temperature of, of the sauce itself. So, so it's in the sauce. yeah, I'll, I'll take, I'll take a, uh, be, because there's not a whole lot of a temperature gradient, okay. right? So if I, if I take just a meat thermometer or a signaling liquid and it's at 130, then I'm good to go. The outside water is yep. an idea. 
Yeah, pretty much. And this extra resting step, I'm going to be honest, I don't always do at home because it takes longer. Okay, it's going to, depending on how big your pan is, sometimes it takes a couple of hours, sometimes it'll take about an hour to two hours for it to fully cool down to that temperature. But it depends on, on how large of, of a braise that you're making, okay? Yes, sir. And you say ribs, but this could be shanks or any anything. The only difference is uh, chicken legs. You want to only braise for an hour. Poultry legs, I mean, like, like duck legs, maybe like an hour and a half. But this can be anything, any tough cut of meat, shank, shoulder. Uh, that's why you break these techniques up. Because I'm talking to you about braising a short rib, but this is a universal technique. So all it would take is a lamb shank and maybe, you know, some Indian spices, and now you have a really unique, you know, Indian style lamb dish that's tender with a beautiful reduction sauce. But the only difference is the flavor structure, right? You're just, you're applying technique, and then you're doing the flavor structure to how you like it. Yes, sir. You said it would be two, if you went 200, it'd be five or six hours and all, but how long is it if you, after, uh, I think you said three hours, or after two hours, you raise it to 250? Uh -huh. Then how long would you cook it for? Uh, so at, at sea level, you're looking at about, so you want to start checking it every 15 to 30 minutes at the three hour mark. And you're looking at about three and a half to four hours total. But really, you just kind of have to get in there every 15 minutes and just check it. Just grab a piece of meat. And the meat will talk to you. You can tell when a meat is still chewy and you can tell when it's, when it's tender. I mean, you, just, you feel it. And if you're braising on the bone, which you should do only because it adds more flavor to the whole process, you just grab your tongs, you wiggle the bone. If the bone wiggles free, then you're done. And then, and then up here, it's... You're looking more four hours. Takes longer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Takes a little longer at altitude. At the higher temp. Yeah, in, in general, it, it, all of your moist heat cooking methods will take longer at altitude. So what about, I mean, the timing on other things, is it similar? You said chicken thighs would be different, but with mm -hmm. the lamb shank, veal shank. Um. Same. But they're, they're, all, they're all the same. So, because they're all really tough cuts of meat that come from four-legged animals that have a lot of collagen in them. The, the collagen in chicken is just slightly... Um, the structure is different, it's not, it's not quite as sturdy, um, and that kind of is true for all forms of poultry. But the bigger the animal, the more, the more structurally uh, beastly their, their collagen will be. Yes, sir. At 200, what would be your total time for poultry? At, at 200, I mean, you're still, you're still looking at one and a half hours, maybe two hours. But with poultry, honestly, I, I actually raised the oven to about 350. Because, it's, because chicken legs themselves, you want to break down some of that collagen, but you can take a chicken leg and you can roast it at a high temperature in the oven, and it's not going to be as tender as, as it could be if you braised it, but it's not going to be chewy as if you did that with a short rib. So the chicken legs are kind of that, that in-between zone of you could either roast them or you could slow cook them or braise them. It depends on the final texture you want, yes. There's a restaurant in D.C. that makes feijoada with a pork shank, uh -huh. one of my favorite things. And I'm sure they use something like this, but it has a huge smoked taste to it. Mm -hmm. Do you think that they smoke it first and then do this? Yeah, I'm sure they do. If it, if it has that smoked taste, I'm sure they smoke it first. They, they could also possibly just be cooking it over smoke, like, like a barbecue method where you, because the, 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 you control the temperature of the smoke and you do a long, slow cook for anywhere from eight to, you know, 14 hours on something like a lamb shank. Yes? The lid askew, mm -hmm. I, I've never done that. So the lid askew is to slowly, it's to allow for some evaporation, because that way you're kind of getting a head start on your reduction, but also too what's happening is the lid askew is going to release steam into your oven just ever so slightly. It's gonna keep a moister environment, which is going to give you a more even cooking environment. Yes, sir. So, like, with, if you're doing the Indian, would you do like when you did the the brown, the searing and the browning? Uh -huh. Would you also do like the onions, the brown masala, the, yep. the cumin, the whole, the whole thing? Absolutely. I mean, so, so just off the top of my head. In, in, the, in the braising liquid. Yeah. So if I was, 
So let's let's switch stuff. I was gonna go cliche Indian and still it'll still be tasty. Um, but I mean India is is such a vastly huge country, and I mean so the the flavors are just insane how they range. But if I was gonna do like a cliche like white boy Indian dish, and I want a little bit of heat, maybe I take a little bit of harissa and I I rub my lamb leg with it, and I sear the uh, and you can even like let that marinate overnight if you have time, right? Or you can just go immediately and sear it in the pan. You get that nice, hard, almost smoky crust because it's going to blacken on you. I set that aside. Take my aromatics, whether it's garlic, whether it's ginger, right? Uh, a lot of times they, they'll toast uh, mustard seed in the oil. So throw a little more fat down there. Toast some mustard seed in the oil. Toast my ginger, my garlic. Throw in some garam masala. Kind of toast that. Any sort of spice mix or blend that you're using is always, especially when you're talking in the sense of curries, is always going to be enhanced by toasting and fat. Okay? If you want to get really kind of technical, you would use either ghee or coconut oil, right? It's gonna, so ghee is basically a clarified butter that's been uh, browned, right? So it has a nutty flavor. You can use coconut oil, which adds its own flavor. Toast all your aromatics. And then deglaze. Deglaze with water, deglaze with wine, deglaze with whatever liquid that you want. And then you add in your stock and you go from there. And then all that flavor is going to be incorporated into your sauce too. Okay? And that's universal for anything. You can go Chinese style. You can rub it with five spice. Right? You can deglaze with some uh, Chinese rice, uh, rice wine. And then you, know, you can throw in a little bit of hoisin sauce for sweetness or throw in a little bit of oyster sauce for funkiness. You know, throw in a little bit of, of, of vinegar to give it some sourness and throw in some palm sugar, brown sugar, sweet, you know, just regular cane sugar to, to balance that sourness from the, the rice wine. Okay? Yes? I use a pressure cooker a lot. Yes. That's neither boiling, steaming, or braising, correct? It's, it would be considered, it would be considered braising. And, and, <clears throat> and here's why is because so a pressure cooker, basically, it creates atmospheric pressure. And we should probably talk about atmospheric pressure. Um, so I'm going to answer that, okay? Are we, are we good on braising? So this is, but this is technically stewing. So in classic French culinary terminology, this is stewing. But when I put a short rib on my menu, that's braise in the traditional method, like, uh, like a stew, I'm going to call it a braised beef short rib. Because what do you think of when I say the word stew? They have a big, hearty, thick bowl of soup. And it's all about communicating with people. Uh, so I'm not like the, the language police when it comes to cooking terms. You know, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say the term that's going to most communicate the end product to you. Now, when making a stew, I'll still use this method. And when braising anything, you want to keep the meat as whole as possible because the, the smaller the meat is, the more surface area it has to extract its juices. So if, I'm, if I want to make a stew, what I'll do is I'll take a big hunk of meat, I'll go through the braising process, and the best case scenario is you do it the day before because the flavors have a chance to meld, and you allow the meat to cool completely uh, in the sauce or in the braising liquid. Uh, after it cools at room temperature, you pop it in your fridge, you let it cool further. The next day, you take the meat out. Hopefully you have to put this on the flame for a little bit to melt the gelatin, which is a good sign. So it's all gelled up. It means you have a lot of good gelatin in there. You remove the meat while it's still cold, cut it into cubes, whatever size you want, and then you reserve. Then you would take your stock, warm it up, you'd strain it because all these vegetables are already spent and so you want more flavorful vegetables to make a soup. And then I would go through the reinforcement process again. So I take my diced carrots, my diced celery, my diced onions, whatever else I want in there, maybe some ginger, maybe some garlic. Uh, if you want a heavy flavor, you can caramelize them at the bottom of the pan. If you don't want a heavy flavor, you can just basically sweat them in a little bit of white wine and butter. Um, if you're worried about the gelatin content in your stock, you can throw in a little bit of flour or you can make a roux separately. Then you add your stock back in. You slowly simmer your vegetables until they're tender, until they're to your liking. So if you like them crunchy, leave them crunchy. If you like them tender, make them tender. But what that's going to do is those vegetables are going to give some of their flavor uh, to that sauce as well. Once your sauce is at the final consistency that you like, whether you, it's just perfect because there's a good amount of gelatin in there, or you need to add a roux to make it more of a hearty stew, then you throw your meat back in. And you cook, and you cook your meat just long enough to heat it through. It's already perfectly cooked. If you fold this process, it already has a lot of good juices in it. And so you're going to have a really flavorful stew without the, the chewy 
sort of texture, the dry meat, meat that you normally get in a lot of homemade stews. Okay? So this is braising, and it's classic, and it's simple, and it's something that you ought not to overthink. Just understand and practice, practice, practice. Okay? So, pressure cookers and atmospheric pressure. So pressure cookers, <coughs> you can braise quicker and faster in. You can also make stocks and extract stocks faster in. And 